Greetings, I'm Bill Mobley, Chairman of the Department of Neurosciences, and this is uh, the next in our installment of Neurosciences Connections. It's my great pleasure to be here at UCSD and to be able to learn about the work of really an outstanding faculty. I'm, I'm today interviewing and speaking with Joe Gleason, uh, a younger member of our department, a very distinguished one to be sure, and I want Joe to tell us about uh, his work, what excites him, and uh, where his work is taking him, uh, and the really important goals that he has for his research in helping people with genetic diseases. Joe? Well, thank you. Uh, first, it's really uh, great to be able to have the opportunity to, you know, tell people what, what our approach and what we're doing in the research laboratory. As you know, my background is in child neurology. Uh, I trained in uh, taking, first in pediatrics, taking care of children in the hospital. And uh, during that time, I was really struck by the number of, of children that had, uh, that were hospitalized for, for brain disorders. And I really wanted to understand more about what led them to their, their particular illness. But then the more I got into this, into this field, in, in the field of, of, of child neurology, where we, we see children with uh, mental retardation, epilepsy, yeah. other types of problems like this, um, the more I realized we didn't know about them. And I really wanted to set my sights in my career to understand the causes with the hopes of being able to develop new therapies. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as we started to, to uh, identify uh, some patients that we wanted to, to, um, to work out the, the genetic basis for these diseases, it became somewhat frustrating. We really weren't able to make very much progress. At that time, we kind of set our sights more on working with, uh, in a particular part of the world, where there's very high rates of inbreeding, uh, mm. parents that are related to one another, that are first cousins. And this has really opened up a whole new field mm. for us because now we can get at the causes for these brain disorders in children much, much more effectively. And uh, that's kind of where our work is going now. It's very exciting. So I guess what you're saying is finding genes is difficult. So you do everything you can to make, uh, to, to increase the efficiency of finding those genes. And it's in families where there's cousin, first cousin marriages that that uh, is made possible. Yes, that's a very important point. You know, we, we see children all the time in the hospital uh, with uh, some sort of uh, subtle or even more um, overt problem with how the brain has formed. Mm -hmm. And as a result, these children have epilepsy or autism or one of these kinds of problems mm -hmm. that, that aren't so infrequent in the U.S., but we really can't get at mm -hmm. the basis for it with the current technologies that are available to us. But <clears throat> if we can get uh, if we can identify even one rare family where there are several children with the same disease, mm. that helps us narrow right in on the chromosome and then on the gene. Mm -hmm. And so we increase our power maybe tenfold. Wow. And that's really the innovation that mm -hmm. we're bringing to this, to this process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, once we find the, the new causes for these diseases, that's going to allow us to, first of all, better, better understand the disease mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. to be able to do a better job with, with prognosis mm -hmm. for these conditions and to begin to think about treatments. These are yeah. some of the most difficult conditions to, to treat because by the time a child is born, already the brain is not functioning properly. Mm -hmm. But I think that with, with new technologies coming out with uh, genetic therapies and stem cell therapies, and all these things we're also excited about in our field, that really understanding the basis for these diseases, that's the first step. Right, so when you find a gene, then theoretically you have to say, well, how does that gene work? Uh, is the gene more active? Is it less active? You must go through a lot of uh, pretty careful uh, strategizing about how best to approach uh, the disease once the gene's been discovered. Yes, it's true. Um, what we find in, in these populations that we, that we work with in, in the Middle East is that uh, for the most part the parents are healthy mm -hmm. and they yet have several children with the same disorder. Mm -hmm. And that inheritance pattern is typical for, for recessive, um, which is, should be distinguished from a dominant condition where a parent will frequently have the same or maybe a subtle, subtler variety mm -hmm. of the disease mm -hmm. of, the, of the child. But in these families, both parents are healthy. Mm -hmm. In that situation, we know that since both parents are carriers for this mutation, that just missing one copy doesn't cause the disease. And based upon that, we, we, we usually assume that the child will be missing both copies of that gene. They'll be shut off. Mm -hmm. So we go into our studies with the assumption that these proteins are just kind of 
stop. They're mm -hmm. just not working at all. Mm -hmm. And then what we, what we need to do is to figure out uh, first why they're not working, mm -hmm. which domain of the protein is blocked. Um, is there some strategy we can do to kind of turn it back on easily? Mm -hmm. um, or is it going to be a longer term thing? Are we based upon this, whatever disease it happens to be, are we talking about um, maybe replacing the gene in, at some, at some mm -hmm. point in the future or using uh, a drugs or something like that to somehow help the pathway, turn the pathway back on. So give us a sense uh, where we are right now and in, in terms of the overall look at genetic diseases. Let's, let's talk about these recessive disorders. I mean, where are we with respect to turning the gene back on, replacing the gene, uh, or discovering mechanisms that the gene engages that we could uh, intervene in? Where are we, just generally speaking? Well, it's a, it's a very, very good question. I mean, what we're entering now is in the field of personalized medicine. I think this mm -hmm. is where, where everyone is so excited about uh, in the field of medicine. And, and the current therapy is, you know, you, you tr take a drug for some poorly dis defined condition and it works in maybe 20%, maybe 20% uh, have side effects and then mm -hmm. the other, uh, the rest of the patients don't have any effect whatsoever. What mm -hmm. we're looking at in the future is designing therapies mm -hmm. that are predicted based upon someone's genetic makeup. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, to, to answer your question though, I'd say there, there's, you know, there's 30,000 genes roughly, mm -hmm. and we would guess that pr probably most of them are doing something important in our body. Um, I would say that um, there's in the range of maybe uh, 5,000 to 10,000 um, uh, disorders that are known to be due to loss of a single gene. Mm -hmm. And where the field is kind of stuck right now is how to how to develop that knowledge mm -hmm. into new therapies. Mm -hmm. There was a very interesting story recently about the field of cystic fibrosis. The gene for that uh, condition was identified 20 years ago. This is the anniversary of that mm -hmm. discovery. Mm -hmm. And um, the critics were saying that uh, you found this gene 20 years, this was not our finding, but mm -hmm. um, other important, you know, very prominent people in the field of genetics. Why hasn't there been new therapies mm -hmm. that have come out of this finding? Um, of course, the, the people in the, in the field say, but look at all the amazing things we found out since this discovery was made. We now know that cystic fibrosis is due to a defect in chloride channels. We know this, the particular mutation, and now we're beginning to understand the, um, uh, the effects that can modify someone's um, severity of disease, and there are now um, approaches towards um, uh, therapy that are going to depend upon the particular type of mutation and mm -hmm. uh, the the, uh, the molecular kind of basis for it. So I think we, we take that as an example. It's not gonna be an overnight switch. Mm -hmm. You develop the therapy and then suddenly someone is better. Mm -hmm. But these are diseases that have been plaguing humans for millennia, for mm -hmm. since the start of the human race. You know, and we're at this point of time in, mm -hmm. in the present, we just feel so lucky because we're now at the very beginning stages of understanding these diseases for the first time. Right. And I think the therapies will come in the future. Yeah. And, and my guess is that we're poised as never before to make that happen because we have much better uh, tools, much better resources than ever before. I mean, we know, much, we know about the human genome now in, in a way, for example, that we certainly didn't even uh, 15 years ago. So it's always good to tell stories. Now, there's a recent story that involves you in your laboratory about a particular syndrome. You want to just tell us about that? Sure. That's a disorder that's... Uh it's called um, Jobert syndrome after mm -hmm. the uh, French doctor, the French Canadian doctor that first identified it. And it's a disorder of, um, of balance in children. The children are born um, with, with some degree of mental, of cognitive impairment and, and poor balance. And as a result, they, they don't breathe properly at birth and the eye movements are not, are not uh, correctly aligned and very high frequency of autism mm -hmm. in this condition. And uh, we tried to find the gene for this condition uh, uh, when I first started my laboratory about 10 years ago. And we spent, maybe, we spent a long time trying to find families in the U.S. that we could, we could use to narrow down on this gene and find what, what, the, what the underlying genetic basis was. We were unsuccessful. And it was about that time I saw some publications from a group in, um, in uh, United Arab Emirates, a relatively small country in, um, in the Gulf region. And, uh, they sent us the, all the, the DNA samples with consent forms and everything like that. And that'll give us the, the opportunity now to go after this gene with much more power, mm -hmm. maybe tenfold more power. Mm -hmm. And we were able to narrow in on this gene mm -hmm. and we were able to find the gene, for, the genetic basis for this condition. Mm -hmm. It turns out that it was, it was a completely unexpected finding because this gene, which is called 
INPP5E metabolizes a particular um, phospholipid mm -hmm. in the body um, called um, phosphatidyl inositol 345 triphosphate. And it's a, it's a long word, but it, it's, a, it's a molecule that has been receiving a huge amount of attention recently in cancer and immunology because mm -hmm. it's one of the most potent um, um, bioactive lipids in the body and, mm -hmm. and responsible for a whole host of homeostatic regulations. So we found mutations in this gene. All the mutations we found were from, were from families with, with consanguinity, with inbreeding, and all the mutations shut off the enzyme. Mm. They just turned it off. Which and would be predicted on the basis of which, Exactly. Yeah. The parents were healthy, yeah. and the children were, had this disease, a, mm -hmm. a quarter of the children. Mm -hmm. And so we were able now for the first time to link this disease to a very well understood mm -hmm. biochemical pathway. Mm -hmm. And so what we're thinking now is could, there, could this discovery now lead to some, well first of all it does lead to, it opens a whole new window of investigation. Sure. How is the development of the brain linked to this biochemical pathway. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that's, that I think the field is going to be eager to start to explore. And, and it makes targets available, mm -hmm. too. You can begin to think about targeting this missing activity also, I guess. Exactly. There's oh, the whole field of cancer biology has been very focused on this pathway mm -hmm. now for mm -hmm. maybe uh, 10 or 15 years. And there are a whole host of, of small molecules, drugs essentially, that have been designed to target a particular aspect of this pathway. So we're thinking, would it be possible mm -hmm. to take something that's already been designed mm -hmm. and think about, <clears throat> think about approaches in, um, in animal models first, of course, and then to see if there's some possible way of bringing that into the patients that we treat. You know, I find it very exciting. So you're sitting in California and you're having trouble getting to the bottom of this really important biological problem and you just look around and suddenly you find this new resource and you take advantage of that new resource and, study, and suddenly you've changed things. It, it will never be true that people will look at the syndrome the same way again. It's brand new days for that syndrome. And I also love the idea of going to the Middle East and working with colleagues. I mean, tell us some stories about your, your travels. Oh, um, you know, it is, it, it, uh, for me, it's a very, very rewarding part of what I do. Mm -hmm. I, um, I love seeing patients. It's what I was, you know, my initial training was in, mm -hmm. in clinical medicine mm -hmm. and child neurology. And uh, when, when I travel, I travel to the Middle East twice a year, generally for a couple weeks each time, and visit maybe five, five countries. And just go, go into the, uh, to work with, with colleagues. These are mm -hmm. uh, very well established and very well known colleagues that are amazing clinicians. That when they, they see mm -hmm. a syndrome, they know it. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> and we evaluate many, many patients, maybe 10 or 15 families a day. Mm -hmm. And when you see a family where the, the parents wheel in three children with the same mm -hmm. condition, Amazing. you really get a sense for that mm -hmm. disease. And mm -hmm. one of my favorite things is to bring young doctors there to mm -hmm. experience this because mm -hmm. it's an unforgettable way of training. Yeah. It really, it really um, instills in, in the junior doctors a sense for what these diseases are and helps you think about um, how to approach mm -hmm. these diseases in a, in a different way. Um, you know what I what I find really <clears throat> remarkable is that is the generosity of these families, how willing they are to participate in studies, mm -hmm. even though they know that their participation probably won't help them directly. Right. The families are are very are very eager to participate in something that can mm -hmm. help people in general, mm -hmm. and this is why one of the very rewarding parts of it is that we have very high rates of participation in the studies. If we see a child with a disease like this, mm -hmm. the parents are usually very eager to help us in any way that they can. And that can involve mm -hmm. providing a DNA sample or a skin biopsy mm -hmm. or clinical records. And then we work very closely with our colleagues in the Middle East. And it's a, it's a, um, a two-way street information going back and forth. As soon as we find something, we let the doctors know and then they mm -hmm. let us know anything that changes with the patient. Great. So it's been a very, very exciting way to, you and know. And think about how rewarding it's gonna be for you someday to go back and see some of these families again and be able to tell them, look, because of what you've done, because of your generosity, our science has prospered and now we know how to handle this problem, how to help people with Joubert syndrome. I, it's it's mm -hmm. inspiring. Well, we see the same diseases in this country, but we're just not able to find the causes for them. Mm -hmm. And now what we, what we do typically is that if we find, make a new discovery of, uh, of a, the cause for a disease, we immediately try to apply that to the U.S. and mm -hmm. we have a whole um, collections of patients with various diseases and we collaborate very broadly with mm -hmm. uh, other research groups that mm -hmm. have 
assembled cohorts of patients with, you know, these, with, with these diseases. And we try to figure out what the importance of a particular, particular gene is in, in, in a broad category of disease. Mm -hmm. For instance, we found recently a gene that causes a very similar disease um, uh, to, do, to Jobert syndrome. Um, the, the one that I told you about before. Mm -hmm. And, and that, disease, that gene we, were, we thought might play a role in autism. Mm -hmm. And so we collaborated with a group at UCLA and he screened, the doctor there screened a, a very large cohort of patients with autism and they found that this gene plays a role, uh, a regulatory role very likely in the, in the risk of developing autism. It's very exciting. So that to me really brings it full circle. If mm -hmm. we can first bring the discovery to patients in the U.S. that we see with these same diseases, and second, if we can broaden our understanding, if that discovery can help um, in even more common, more complex disease, mm -hmm. that to me is really a very rewarding part of the whole aspect of this. Great stuff. Joe, thanks for being with me. I'm proud of you, and I look forward to many, many exciting future discoveries. Thank you very much. Well, thanks so much. Glad you're here. Okay. Thanks.